most of the work I'm going to be talking about was actually done by a very smart PhD student, Ophir Weiss, uh, who you might know from some of the foreshadow stuff that's been going on. Um, he did most of the work I'm going to tell you about today. Uh, but first of all, I'm going to give you a quick recap of what Linux Boot actually is for those of you that might need a little reminder. Uh, I think yesterday we already had some speakers say that UEFI was a dumpster fire, so I don't have to. Um, uh, and you know, you can come up with a bunch of different solutions to that, but something we ended up doing was uh, replacing large parts of UEFI with Linux in Flash. Um, that came from the observation that Linux, Linux is actually compilable as a, an EFI application. So you can actually drop it in kind of like it is a Dixie um, in a UEFI firmware volume. And uh, from there, uh, you know, Linux knows how to initialize devices, so you start removing some of those drivers and all that stuff. Um, and from there, we've been using kexec to execute like a, a kernel from disk or download something from the network and execute it. Um, so, Basically, we've traded you know, one set of complexities for a different set of complexities, right? Like we've traded the not very visible UEFI complexity for the very visible and auditable and very often looked at Linux kernel complexity. Um, you can feel about that trade-off as you like. Uh, I'm gonna take it as a given for now. Um, one of the nice side effects we get from this is also uh, reproducible builds are actually possible and doable with Linux and an, an InterMFS. Um, I don't know how far EDK2 is in that space. Um, but I'm going to do something slightly different today. I'm not going to tell you all that much about the, the security trade-offs of this thing. I think most of you probably already know what Linux boot is or you've heard the other talks about uh, the, the PC engines and uh, all that stuff. Uh, I want to tell you what we've actually been doing in the last year or so. Um, I think the one relevant piece to also keep in mind there is uh, Linux boot is not only a thing we do on UEFI. As you heard from like the system transparency talk, there are people doing core boot in Linux boot. Um, and uh, the embedded world has probably been doing U-boot and Linux in Flash for quite a while longer than we have. Um, but then the, the, the question uh, that you're probably asking next is, what's actually in that initRAMFS um, that we put in Flash with Linux? And uh, if you ask our kernel team, uh, some of the people we talk to, we're actually pointlessly rewriting everything in Go. Um, but you know, the, the observation we had was, we now have Linux in Flash. Let's actually try to use a memory safe language instead of staying in the C world. Um, use a language that makes concurrency easy. Uh, so Uroot is a project that has written a bunch of like busy box-like tools, like all the stuff you find on Linux, plus a kexec based bootloaders. Um, and that's actually what most of the talk-ish is going to be about, uh, the, the bootloaders that we've been building and some of the infrastructure. Because I think we've talked a lot about security concepts um, and architectural things. Um, but one of the things that I think will eventually set this apart from some of the UEFI dumpster fire is that uh, we're building some infrastructure um, around things. So for example, um, you know, in the last year, we had grown quite apart uh, in the Linux boot ecosystem. Facebook had started writing their own like bootloaders and we had start, started writing our own. Those are finally coming together. Um, we're starting to care more about the actual project health. Uh, for example, you know, deduplication like this because there's a lot of this stuff going on. The other thing is, you know, uh, one thing that I would like to see more uh, like bootloader and firmware projects do is actually have pre-submit tests that do stuff like you know VM-based integration tests that are easy to write for developers. Um, I'm not showing you this to like 
actually read the code. I just want to show you that it should be as easy as writing like 20 lines of code to get one of these tests running and implement it. Um, so here, for example, you can write a Go unit test like in the, in the upper right corner. And there's the infrastructure to like launch this test in a VM and gather all the test outputs and uh, statuses. So actually running this like QMU started VM test is as simple as saying go test uh, when you get to the project. So we're trying to make it easier for developers. Um, for bootloader tests like this, for example, it's like you specify what you actually want to be in, a, in the VM, you specify what should actually be run in the VM, and you have a little bit of an expect script. Um, it's kind of hard to test bootloaders in unit tests, so this is the current solution we've come up with. But anyway, so this is like stuff we've built in the last year. Um, one piece of progress we've made, you've probably heard from the PC Engines talk, is that we wrote a k-exec uh, bootloader for multi-boot. So uh, you, know, you can actually k-exec t-boot from here if you care about that sort of thing, or k-exec zen like uh, the, the guys from 3mdeb are doing. Um, this is kind of interesting, because we can probably claim we're the only people in the world writing bootloaders in Go. Um, uh, and have the like requisite unit tests to show for it. Um, but the, the question that comes from there uh, pretty often is, can we actually boot Windows? Oh man, that GIF is not the way it was supposed to be. Anyway, um, uh, the, the question we get next is, can it actually boot Windows? Um, That's where Ophir's work comes in. Um, I had some crazy ideas that I outlined in some OCP talk quite a while ago, and uh, they were indeed crazy. Um, so when Ophir started as an intern, he was like, this sounds like a, re a really exciting project and I want to do it, but it's like, it sounds like unachievable in the next three months. Uh, what he actually did was like <clears throat> uh, get the project into a simplified space where we could actually execute it. Anyway, the, the, the basic idea was, why don't we make Linux UEFI compliant so that we can k-exec Windows from Linux? Um, and I know the initial reaction that a lot of people had was, that sounds like a lot of complexity, like you're trying to emulate all this stuff. Um, I hope I get to positively surprise you with how little is actually needed to do this. Um, so our, our goal for this project was to k-exec the Windows Boot Manager. So the first question we're going to ask is, what do you actually need to boot Windows or to boot an arbitrary EFI application? And it comes down to basically three things. One, you need a P32 executable loader, right? You need to be able to parse the binary format of these things and load it into ring zero. And that's mostly covered by k-exec system call today with some parsing code in user space, right? Um, the next thing you need is the right pointers to pass to the entry point, right? Um, an EFI application's entry point looks like this. The, the part that matters most here is the system table that points to, I'm going to say, a bunch of function pointers that are routines sitting around somewhere and points to some configuration stuff like ACPI tables and stuff like that. Um, and the, the third thing that these applications, for the most part, expect is physical addressing, right? Um, when you boot the Windows bootloader, it's going to expect to have a physical address space or at least like one-to-one -one mapped virtual to physical addressing. Um, so, you know, We've all probably heard of how large the UEFI spec is. Um, I think the first part of this is investigating what do you actually need out of that spec, right? Uh, the easiest part to figure that out is you take EDK2 from upstream, you add a bunch of prints around the boot services and protocols, um, 
you compile it as OVMF to be run in QMU, and you boot Windows in QMU, right? You collect all those prints, uh, you write some like scripts to make sense of all that data, and what you get is that the minimum required EFI boot services are actually not that many. Um, out of the 44 you know, function pointers to routines, there's maybe like 10 that actually matter. Um, and you know, some of these are you know, like allocating memory, uh, looking at the memory map of the system. Like these are not actually all that hard to implement. Um, what matters a little more is uh, the open and close protocol call. Because from there, it's you know, another arbitrary set of function pointers you could be getting from a bunch of stuff. But you know, out of like hundreds of protocols in the UEFI spec, the ones you actually need to boot Windows are these six protocols. Um, and you don't actually need that last one there, the graphics protocol, but it was a lot cooler when that was implemented than without. Um, for the most part, this boils down to uh, you need some I.O. You need to be able to read stuff from disk, and you need to be able to interact with the keyboard somewhere. Um, that's basically what these protocols are. So, you know, launching Windows via KXEC is basically a three-step process. There's like three different executables that load each other. You load the boot manager, the boot manager loads winload.efi, and winload.efi eventually loads the, uh, the, the actual kernel. Um, so, I'm going to describe to you a little bit of the debugging process of this. <laughs> um, it basically boils down to, okay, we've collected all this information, let's start implementing some stuff. So you start with like a Hello World EFI application, you compile it, you have like a P32K exec loader, and you, know, you dump that into memory and you go. Like, okay, it's obviously gonna crash. Um, from there, uh, Ophir came up with some pretty interesting debugging steps uh, that I'm gonna tell you a little bit about. We tried to learn about as much about you know, the Windows bootloader from there as you can, given that it's, you know, not very accessible to you, uh, and then you fix the problem. Um, so, you know, like an example of this is you have an illegal memory access at this random address somewhere. Um, and notice, by the way, this is still virtual memory, or it is virtual memory, right? And, you know, the stack trace in GDB is not going to be all that useful, GDB attached to QMU. Um, but from there, you can at least try to figure out, you know, what, what's the offset of this address in the image of the binary that's currently running. So you've you got to know if it's like, is it the boot manager or the kernel or winload.efi, and then figure out, you know, where in that binary are we actually to look at the code. So he wrote some scripts that like, let you translate this more automatically because math is hard, and uh, I can't do that in my head. Um, so you figure out the, the address in this image, but like, you know, if you decompile, uh, or sorry, disassemble the Windows bootloader, it's not like you're gonna get any symbols, right? It's not, you know, the production version is not compiled with debug symbols or any useful information for you. But interestingly, um, there's this thing, I don't exactly know what it's called, a Microsoft symbol server. Um, and that happens to be hooked up to IDA. Uh, we, we initially considered like writing our own API to this thing, but like it's much easier to just start IDA, dump in the binaries, um, and dump in the address, and figure out, oh, okay, here's like at least the name of the function we're in. From there, uh, it's pretty easy to take that function name and uh, go through the React OS bootloader source code to find the basically exact same implementation of the same function. Um, from there, you know, the, while that seems like a very roundabout way to figure out what's going on, uh, it's easier to read that code than to read the assembly by hand all the time for every crash. Um, although, you know, in the end, you're going to have to do that sometimes. Um, so, you know, in the beginning, it was actually pretty simple. We didn't worry about the physical addressing. We just dumped the app into memory. Uh, we jumped into it, and EFI, for the most part, you know, the 
EFI applications are relocatable binaries. So for the most part, it didn't care. Um, like for the hello world, you know, you make an allocate page call in the Linux kernel that translates to a K malloc, you know, like three lines of code or something. Um, you give back the address, uh, still the virtual address, and it all works fine. The trouble is that at some point, um, the Windows bootloader decides to change the page tables, right? Like it decides that, you know, we're still in physical addressing. That kind of sucks for me. I want to install some page tables because that's what we've pretended is the situation so far. Um, at which point, of course, you take a fault and that address you gave back from allocate page doesn't make any sense anymore. Um, the hack we've come up with so far is uh, to install both the virtual address and the physical address in the same page table and still hand that back to the Windows kernel. So you hand that, you know, the physical address, quote unquote, back to the EFI application and from Linux, you can still use the virtual memory. Um, this is, as you're all going to say, totally a hack. What should actually happen is a context switch of like, we have, you know, physical, um, like a, a set of page tables that's just one-to-one -one mapped, and we should be switching to those when we jump to Windows and just, you know, computing the addresses. But uh, I'm going to call the work that we did this summer charitably a prototype. Um, so this is what it is right now. Um, yeah, this is basically what I just described. Uh, but like for the most part, the Linux kernel implementation for that is like not that hard. You came out like you map it one to one, you hand it back, and stuff still works. Um, so you know there's still page tables, but we're pretending we're in the physical address space. Um, you know, so you go through this process of fixing small crashes and stuff, and for the most part, you know, implementing those protocols and some of those uh, routines is actually not, not all that interesting. Um, you know, reading from disk boils down to open dev SDA1, read block, right? Um, so after you fix this physical addressing issue and you implement two or three more protocols, you actually get to a point where it looks like something's running, right? Exit boot services was called at some point. Um, if you look at the addresses, you'll find that most things are in some idle loop, and you actually find that one core is uh, in a system call. Um, Ophir called this locked-in syndrome. Uh, you know, we hadn't implemented really any of the I.O. things that let us figure out where we're at in the boot process other than through GDB. Um, so the first thing we did after this is enable kernel debugging. Uh, you know, you can take that same file system you, you uh, um, installed your Windows uh, stuff to. You boot it somewhere where the bootloader actually works. You turn on this like kernel debugging stuff and emergency console, uh, and you start getting some output. Uh, I mean, it doesn't make any sense, but it's pretty cool. Um, from there, eventually, you get to this emergency shell. Uh, this doesn't look like it's Windows, but uh, eventually, from here, you can log into a console that gives you an actual like Windows prompt command shell. Um, Ophir said that this is the like the only time he's ever been excited to uh, see the output IP config, <laughs> but uh, you know this was pretty cool, like a really nice milestone. Um, it was actually kind of at this point that it was almost the end of the internship. Uh, we started like saying we're going to write a bunch of documentation so people can debug this later. Um, like he documented that whole debug process with IDA and GDB and the scripts and stuff. Um, and uh, I was of the opinion that it would be much cooler if we actually ended up implementing graphics. But he felt, you know, that's going to be like a two-week thing. Graphics are complicated. It's really hard. Um, it, it turns out, actually, that when we hit this milestone, and I posted about it on Twitter uh, there, someone else responded from Intel and said, hey, I've been doing the same thing. 
<laughs> um, uh, and I actually got, just got to the same point. Look at my graphics output here. And I was like, so hey, how long did it take you to implement graphics? And he was like, a couple hours or so. So, you know, I was like, dude, um, you got to do it. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the, you know, looking at the graphics output protocol in UEFI, it actually turned out to be pretty simple. It says, please give me a, pr a frame buffer. Um, and the protocol like, gets the frame buffer from somewhere, presumably in UEFI from some driver. But in Linux, you know, it's another case of open dev FB0, you know, allocate the frame buffer, get the right pointer, give it back to the bootloader. Um, and you know, you'll find some crashes because you need to mark that memory reserved in the correct way and all that stuff. But uh, once you fix that, um, you know, initially you get this like Windows logo screen, uh, and then for the most part it crashed. But once you fix that like allocation crash, um, you actually get to a login screen. Uh, I think in the end this took him about two hours to actually do, uh, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, uh, from that point, uh, it became pretty simple, right? Um, unfortunately, I don't have a demo for you today because I uh, failed to bring the right laptop to do it on. Fortunately, a Chromebook is not the right device to do this with. Um, so, you know, in the end, um, if you look at the code and all the instructions to debug all this stuff, uh, you know, I thought this would be very complicated. Uh, even I thought that there would be a lot more protocols to implement. But it turns out the Linux kernel module, I, I'm not going to call it a module, it's a hack uh, in a C file somewhere right now, um, turns out to be less than 4,000 lines of code to actually implement this. And if someone went to clean it up and actually make it nice, I bet it could actually be even less. Um, so, you know, initially the assumption that we're going to re-implement all this complexity of UEFI turned out to be not all that true. Um, I thought that was pretty cool, and I think that actually means that this is maybe a viable thing to do in the future. Um, so I hope that some of you at least will go and try it out. Um, questions? I should say there's a very detailed readme at that first link that will tell you how to debug almost any of these crashes. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, how about uh, runtime se services? Do you need any of them to boot Windows, or have you implemented? Uh, Sorry, do, I, do we need any of what? Uh, runtime, uh, runtime services. Ah, yeah, I kind of glossed over that, didn't I? Um, so at the moment, we pass, we're booting OVMF plus Linux, and we're passing OVMF's runtime services to Linux at the moment. And, you know, I, I don't want Linux to stay alive past exit boot services, you know, to pr provide runtime services. That seems silly, and that seems like a lot of complexity that is not really necessary. Um, we did kind of look into what does Windows actually use out of the runtime services, and it's not that much. Uh, and I plan to, at some point, or maybe I would encourage someone else to, uh, implement like a small self-contained binary of runtime services that we can put in memory to execute with Windows. That would probably have to implement, when it comes down to it, like four or five of the runtime services calls. The ones that I think are interesting are like get time, I think is uh, one that's actually used, as well as like setting and getting UEFI variables. Uh, you know, a simple first implementation of that could be just keep it in memory in those runtime services somewhere. Uh, see if you can make that work. Um, I think on on server systems, those like UEFI variable setting and getting might be like Maybe we'll make it a call to the BMC. Um, I'm not exactly sure. So the answer is we punted on that problem for now. <laughs>
Um, this might be a trivial question, not really my area, but early, in an earlier slide, um, Uroot was, uh, they selected Go for a lot of things, and one of the reasons was um, because it had great concurrency properties. I'm curious what, like, motivated that as a criteria. Um, it's actually kind of silly. I, it motivates me for a criteria because I don't know if you've used option ROMs on machines with multiple NICs. They all boot in sequence, uh, trying to DHCP for 60 seconds at a time. And that's just like simply a thing you don't have to do. Um, and like, you know, with easy concurrency in Go, like that's not even a problem to speak of. So that's my example for this for now. I don't, you probably don't really actually need it. Um, for the most part, other than that. I think that mic is not on. So I'm not familiar with what is the expectations around flash protection on the early stages? <laughs> um, I would say that of outside of the scope of Linux boot itself, right? Because like Linux boot comes in much later in the boot process. You're going to initialize stuff with core boot or UEFI or U-boot. And uh, I think the flash protections are probably not, shouldn't be relevant to us at that point. Yeah, ideally not. Uh, to the previous question about like runtime services and stuff like that, like a lot of systems, the vendors, you said, like, let's make a small little runtime services thing. A lot of vendors implement their variable services in SMM specifically because the, the crux of their flash protection is they have to depend on people can't manipulate the flash except from SMM. And so yeah. if you were to do that, that would kind of imply that the thing has to be pushed back a level to something that can stick it into SMM, or you have to have an alternative flash protection mechanism. Yeah, that, that's why I mentioned that on server systems, we might want to just make it a call to the BMC. Yeah, that's I don't what I want things to, to be in SMM either. Um, but I think that's kind of an orthogonal problem to solve to, to this. Um, un unless, of course, like the Linux boot has to know, you know what stuff has been implemented in SMM to be able to call that from the runtime services. Um, so I, that's why I think we need to start with like an implementation that just keeps it in memory and pretends to do all the password stuff that UEFI variables implement. Um, and I welcome suggestions from there. All right.